Hey guys, it's Maggie and I am back today and today I wanted to talk about one of the more common questions that I get particularly on Instagram. I don't know why Instagram, but I get this question a lot there and it's usually a person that is experiencing GI symptoms and they want to know how I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease or what symptoms I had that led up to me going to the doctor and saying, hey, something's wrong. So I'm gonna talk about the early days of Crohn's disease, what it looked like for me prior to all of my surgeries that I've had, some of the symptoms that I experienced as a young person. I started having Crohn's symptoms as young as eight years old and uh, what that kind of looked like. You all are so fortunate not to be seeing me in my robe right now. Um, I'm freezing cold and I guarantee you as soon as I'm done filming this, it, it's coming back on. <laughs> Anyways, I want to talk about the early days of Crohn's disease. Like I said, I started experiencing symptoms as young as eight years old and it did take quite a while for me to get my diagnosis. I may be wrong about this, but I think as there has been more online advocacy and patients talking about their experience. People are becoming more educated about autoimmune diseases and therefore able to advocate for themselves a little bit better and ask the correct questions to kind of help their doctor help them get a diagnosis. I'm sure there are still people out there that take years and years to get a diagnosis. Like myself, it took about four years for me to get the Crohn's diagnosis, but I, I feel like with the education and knowledge around it that people are able to um, maybe just understand that yes, there is something going on with me that that isn't how my body should be working. I get the question a lot on Instagram about, you know, how did you get your diagnosis? What symptoms did you have? And it's usually patients that are experiencing some sort of GI symptom or symptoms and they're worried. Uh, they don't know what's going on and because they have access to information online now, they're asking the question. So I thought I would do a video for all of those people that asked me this question. I think it's also really important to preface this by saying Crohn's disease, while it is, you know, one of the inflammatory bowel diseases, bowel being the key word there, there are a lot of extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease. And that just means symptoms that are happening outside of the GI tract. I have had a number of them myself, but they definitely appeared later on when I was first diagnosed and first experiencing Crohn's symptoms. They were mainly all GI related, which as a like preteen <laughs> young child, uh, experiencing this, it, it was not fun. The first symptom that I ever remember happening was severe constipation. And usually with Crohn's disease, there's a higher percentage of people experiencing the total opposite. They're experiencing very loose stools, diarrhea, very unpleasant. But for me, I was experiencing severe constipation. I remember um, being very young, probably, I must have been in about second, third grade, and I was experiencing just the worst time in the bathroom. Lots of pain trying to go, to the point where I would shed tears because it was so painful. And, you know, as a kid, I didn't really understand what was going on, and I hadn't had any other indication that there was something wrong. I was still growing fine. I was the same size as all of my classmates. I was probably like average at that point, but there was no other indication that something was going on. I still had an appetite, but I was just really struggling to go to the bathroom. And this progressed over time. My dad started to mention things to my pediatrician saying, you know, her, her appetite's going down and she's not growing. And what they kept telling my dad was, well, just have her drink more milk, you know, try and have her eat more. Um, they were kind of thinking that I was a picky eater. So from the span of me being about eight years old to 11, it just continued to get worse where I started to have abdominal pain. I started to experience these episodes of really sudden nausea. I have two memories of this nausea, but I know that it happened probably hundreds of times. Um, 
one of the first, it was after school, but I was in my classroom with my classmates because there was some sort of concert going on. We were gonna play our recorders or whatever. And I remember we were watching a movie and I suddenly had that severe nausea. And all I knew how to do was just swallow, keep swallowing, because I didn't want to throw up in front of my friends. And thankfully I was able to keep swallowing it down until it passed. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I didn't know what to do. I was so embarrassed. And then the other memory that I have was I was on the phone with my mom and I suddenly had that feeling of intense nausea where if I were to open my mouth, it was gonna come out at ya. So <laughs> I remember I had to stop talking. And my mom's like, hello, hello. And I just had to stop talking and wait for it to pass. And I think I handed the phone to my dad. Um, I was probably in third or fourth grade at that point. So yeah, just these weird symptoms that were really causing issues. And I think the two tipping point symptoms that I really had was my growth just plateaued. I stopped growing. I went from being average with my classmates to being one of the smallest and skinniest. Um, I was stuck at about 50 pounds at the age of must have been, that was probably when I was nine or 10. And I just, I just stopped growing. And the other one that started that was probably the more scary one was blood in my stool. I don't know if that happened prior to diagnosis or after, but I had a lot of blood. <laughs> like, not a little. A lot like that was basically all that was coming out of me um, and I think that's one of the scariest symptoms of Crohn's disease it's it's just a shocking thing to see it's a shocking thing to remember and I'm very thankful that I have not had that experience in a very 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 long time but as a kid seeing that much blood in the toilet yeah it's it's not a pleasant experience so I think that that was either uh, what made us, you know, go back to the doctor and say there is something seriously wrong or it was after diagnosis and we realized this is a serious disease. I don't remember because I was young. I finally got my diagnosis at the age of 11 and essentially the way that that worked out was we kept going back to the pediatrician. My dad kept saying, she's not growing, she's not eating, What what is going on? And finally a doctor said, I think that she may have Crohn's disease and thankfully both of my parents knew what that was. That's not always the case, but if you did not know, my mom was a nurse, she has since passed away, but she was a nurse and um, she did more like home care stuff, but she described uh, Crohn's disease after I was diagnosed with it. She described it as dumping syndrome, which is not what Crohn's disease is, so don't get them mixed up. She was not as familiar with GI disorders and she was taking it more in the literal sense. I think that's why she called it like, you have dumping syndrome. That's not what dumping syndrome is. It is not Crohn's disease, it's not IBD. But she knew what Crohn's disease was, she just didn't know the name for it. And then my dad knew of it because he had actually gone to school as a child with somebody who had Crohn's and they wound up having to get a colectomy. So that was my dad's memory and he said, oh, he was out of school for months and months and you know, he was really sick and stuff. So he had kind of a, <laughs> He was, he was really worried. My dad said that when he heard of the diagnosis for me, his, you know, stomach dropped and he was not happy. But essentially, my pediatrician finally said, I think that she might have inflammatory bowel disease and let's get her over to a GI specialist and see what's going on. So he referred me over to a GI, which I've mentioned before, this GI was absolutely terrible, <laughs> but at least, helped me get the diagnosis. Not that that meant anything to this doctor because this is the same one that said I had an eating disorder when I was actually obstructed, but they got me the diagnosis and the process of that was first we did blood work. Everything was off kilter. Everything was just not where it was supposed to be. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember one of the most, um, I remember the one number that really stands out the most to me, the one that I had 
the most trouble with after diagnosis, that was my hemoglobin. I regularly sat at a seven to eight for hemoglobin, and if you're familiar, you don't wanna be there. Probably from all that bleeding I was doing. <laughs> but I had that done, and then I got a colonoscopy, which showed inflammation all the way from my esophagus down to my rectum. So I had active Crohn's throughout my entire system. I believe I also got a barium swallow, which you know what? I haven't gotten one of them in a very long time. Like since I was treated as a child, I don't, maybe it's cause my upper system is fine, but got a barium swallow to see if there were any narrow spots. And I don't believe at diagnosis I had any stricturing yet, or at least it wasn't that severe. Um, so I believe those are all the tests they did to diagnose me. I remember the colonoscopy like it was yesterday. Uh, my mom was still alive at that point. So my mom was the one to try to give me the enema to help clear out my lower bells. <laughs> and that did not go well. It was, it was awful because I was a kid that never experienced any illness, you know, hadn't had IVs, hadn't had anything. The only other time that I had been anywhere in a hospital or anything like that for myself was I used to have a pretty severe case of asthma and I had to go to the emergency room one time um, to get treated for it because I was having a really bad asthma attack. That was it. That was the only time, <laughs> the only experience I had in the hospital. So this was all completely new to me and scary. I was scared to swallow pills. I was, um, and I was put on those big, you know, Pentassa horse pills that are, you have to take so many of them and they didn't do a darn thing for me. It was just a lot of new stuff for me, a lot of, you know, procedures and scopes and um, DEXA scans and uh, x-rays and all these different things, it was just totally new to me. So I understand as a person that is experiencing GI symptoms, how you can be terrified that IBD is your potential diagnosis. And I think it's really important to remember that when it comes to this stuff, you have to take it one day at a time, sometimes one hour by hour, because it's a lot in the beginning. But I will say, let's see, if I was eight when I first started showing symptoms, so it's been over 20 years since I started with my Crohn's symptoms, I've gotten used to everything that I need to do. Obviously, there are moments that I am overwhelmed, but I, I know what it takes. I know what I need to do to care for myself. Um, and I know that looks different than the average person who might not have a chronic illness, but it just, it does come with time. And I also understand that desperate want for answers and a name to what you're experiencing. Um, but in saying that, just because you have GI symptoms, it does not necessarily mean that you have inflammatory bowel disease. There are a number of reasons a person might show GI symptoms. And, you know, it might be some sort of chronic condition. It might not be. It might be an acute illness. I mean, Zach's had acute illnesses before and he is healthy as a horse. So just because you're experiencing some of the things that I may have experienced, it does not necessarily mean you have Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, any of the IBDs. And if it does mean that you have a form of inflammatory bowel disease, know that you will learn how to manage it. It takes practice, it takes time, it takes a lot of learning that I know you didn't sign up for, completely understand that, but you will get accustomed to the rhythm of having an illness like this. That's not me saying that it's all pleasant, you know, sunshine and rainbows, cause it's not, it's not, but <laughs> you do get used to it. And I also think it's really important to mention if you are in the diagnosis process right now and you're looking at a channel like mine where I talk about the surgeries I've had, the other complications I've had, the ostomy that I now live permanently with, I want you to know 
that, you know, I like to share about my ostomy and all the things I've experienced because I've overcome a lot of that. And I have lived successfully despite all of that. And I live well, you know, I have quality of life. That's what we're all really hoping for when it comes to life anyway. I want you to know that this outcome that I have experienced is not necessarily the outcome that you will have. I know if you have no experience with ostomies and you've never had one, seeing somebody with one that has the same diagnosis as you can be scary. I've been there. I remember being young prior to my ostomy and seeing other people with Crohn's disease that had ostomies. And I was like, oh my gosh, I hope that's not my future. And you know what? It isn't always a Crohn's disease person's future. So please keep that in mind. I think it's important to talk about it openly. That's why I do share about my ostomy, but also know that it might not necessarily be in your future. But if you're worried about it, please watch some of my other videos covering it so you can see how I manage it and, you know, how I live well with it because I really do. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I'm excited to be doing my sit-down videos again. I love it. <laughs> and uh, I hope you guys are feeling good. I will see you in the next. Bye, guys. Bye.